beneath the normal internet we all know, like YouTube, Facebook and Google, there lies the dark web, an anonymous, unregulated world with websites not accessible from search engines, a hidden corner of the internet where anything goes. For a while, the biggest site on the dark web was Silk Road an online black market for all kinds of illegal goods and services, ranging from body parts to weapons to hitmen and most commonly of all, drugs. In fact, Silk Road was dubbed the Amazon of drugs because you could simply go to the Silk Road site, buy any substance you wanted with just a few clicks and have it shipped to your doorstep like an Amazon package. But what's perhaps most surprising of all about this is who was behind this illegal empire. Meet Ross Ulbricht, our story's surprising protagonist. Ross grew up in a loving family in Texas. He was a boy scout as a kid, studied physics at university, and was thought of as a very sweet guy by all his friends and family. So imagine their shock when they realized Ross was the criminal mastermind behind the largest online drug empire in history, responsible for over $1.2 billion worth of sales of illegal goods and services. Not just that, but this sweet kid had reportedly paid hitmen to kill his enemies. Or did he? To this day, there is debate over whether Ross is guilty or not. So in this video, we're going to dive into the murky world of the dark web and explore the true story behind the infamous Silk Road marketplace. We're also going to look at how the government really managed to track down Ross, despite the fact that Ross was using the Tor browser, which made him completely anonymous. How do you find someone who can't be tracked? This is a true story filled with mysteries, twists, and even a couple of corrupt government agents. Welcome to the fascinating story of the Silk Road Empire. Ross Ulbricht wanted to change the world, but his life so far had been a series of almosts. He tried several business ideas, but never quite got anywhere with them, and he was starting to feel like his life was passing him by. However, there was one business idea Ross kept coming back to, an online marketplace where people could buy or sell anything imaginable with no limits or restrictions. Now you see, Ross was a staunch libertarian and would regularly debate with people about why the government shouldn't have so much control over people's lives, especially when it came to drugs, which he felt should all be legalized. He'd say it's not the government's right to tell people what they can or can't put in their bodies. And whenever someone tried to argue back about safety concerns, Ross would say, well, should we outlaw Big Macs from McDonald's too? Because they make people gain weight and have heart attacks and die. Or what about cars? They kill millions every year. And so to Ross, the idea of a marketplace where people could buy and sell whatever they wanted was not just a business to potentially make a lot of money. In his view, it was also a way to free people and help the world. After some research, Ross discovered there was a web browser called Tor, which allowed you to access the dark web where you couldn't be tracked or traced. The Tor browser was actually developed by the US Navy as a way to communicate privately over the internet by concealing a user's real IP address and identity. By using this, Ross realized people would be able to buy things online without the government being able to see what they were doing. But at first, Ross didn't go any further with the idea, because there was no way to accept payments online that couldn't easily be traced. For example, credit cards would keep a log of every transaction someone made and be linked to their bank accounts. So for a little while, the site remained just an idea in Ross's mind. Until the summer of 2010, when Ross came across a new technology called Bitcoin, a digital currency which could be transferred anonymously, thus allowing people to buy whatever they wanted without a trace. It was exactly what he needed. So, from his bedroom, Ross began working on his new online marketplace. He decided to call it Silk Road, named after a famous trade route that had started over 2,000 years ago that people used for centuries to carry all kinds of different goods. Understandably, Ross was very wary of anyone knowing about the site he was building, which unfortunately meant he had to build it all by himself. The only person he told at first was his girlfriend, Julia. Now, his girlfriend was a little concerned, but Ross reassured her that thanks to the Tor web browser and Bitcoin, it would all be completely anonymous, so nothing could be traced back to him. As for making the site itself, it was slow work to figure everything out, as building an entire online marketplace by himself was a massive job. But Ross was determined, and he worked very long hours to make it a reality. Sat at his laptop coding all day and most of the nights, he would just occasionally take a break to watch one of his favorite shows, Breaking Bad, the story of a normal guy who becomes a drug kingpin. 
However, as Ross was finally nearing completion of the Silk Road sites, he realized he had a problem. He needed some product to actually sell on his new marketplace. It was no use building the platform if when people first came, there was nothing to buy. So Ross rented out a building in the middle of nowhere and began growing his own magic mushrooms, using a book that was essentially a dummy's guide to building your own mushroom farm. This would be the first product to ever be sold on the Silk Road marketplace. By early 2011, after a year of work on the site, he was ready to launch it to the world. He'd added categories for all different types of drugs. To begin with, the only item listed was the mushrooms he'd grown himself, but the plan was that sellers from all over the world would list their own items for sale. Of course, in order to attract both buyers and sellers to the site, he needed to promote it. Remember, sites on the dark web are not picked up by search engines, and it's also not like Ross could just run some Facebook or Google ads to help find customers for his illegal marketplace. So to get a word out about his new site, Ross went onto several internet forums to spread the word. For example, he joined a site called The Shroomery for fans of shrooms and made a post pretending to be a customer interested in using Silk Road. The reason he did this was so it didn't seem like he was promoting his own websites. He knew that by casually name dropping Silk Road, people on the forums would go and check it out for themselves. And they did. Orders soon started coming in. Now, this was all happening at the beginning of 2011, and at the same time, Ross was working at a little bookstore in Texas called Good Wagon Books. But this worked out really well, because it meant Ross had everything he needed to easily ship out his shrooms. Because he was able to use the bookshop's padded envelopes and label maker, he also used a vacuum sealer that normally would keep food fresh to wrap the mushrooms up. So Ross was in business, and was initially shipping off orders twice a week. But as the site's popularity grew through word of mouth, Ross soon had to start mailing shipments out every day as more and more orders were coming in. But even better than that, other people had started selling items on Silk Road. Other dealers had created their own listings, with everything from weed to coke to ecstasy. And of course, more products for sale helped attract even more buyers, and Silk Road initially took a 6.23% commission on every single trade. In order to make people feel more comfortable using the sites, Ross also built a rating system where buyers and sellers could review each other, similar to eBay's feedback system or Amazon reviews. Ross worked tirelessly on the site and was constantly exhausted, but he was also incredibly excited by its growth. When he first made the site, he honestly hadn't been sure if anyone would use it at all, and yet in just a couple of months, he'd already made thousands of dollars in revenue. He told his girlfriend Julia about the progress of the site, although she was slightly less excited. Julia was concerned by the fact harder drugs were now being sold on Silk Road, especially when she realized someone had even started selling heroin on there. Her doubts about the whole thing started to grow, and she asked Ross, what if someone overdoses? or sellers send out stuff that's been tampered with or laced with something else. Ross confidently reminded her of the rating system. He said if someone sells bad drugs, they'd get a bad rating and no one will buy from them again. Julia simply said, yeah, but how are they supposed to give a bad rating if they're dead? While Silk Road had been growing fairly quickly through word of mouth, growth started to get crazy once Gorka wrote an article about the sites. Right after that article went live, many other news sites started writing about Silk Road as well, describing it as an underground website that lets you buy any drug imaginable. Even big TV news networks like ABC and NBC began talking about the site, thus bringing it even more attention. Thousands of drugs came through the black website called Silk Road. Of course, not all that attention was good. Multiple different government agencies were now watching the site and beginning to investigate who was running it. But because of the use of Tor, they knew tracking whoever was behind it would be extremely difficult. Meanwhile, Ross started working on Silk Road full time. He had no choice really, it was growing so much quicker than he ever expected. The site now had hundreds of sellers and thousands of buyers. And whilst Ross had sold all the mushrooms he'd grown, he was now making commissions on every sale from the site. As more money rolled in, it was exhilarating. But one morning he opened his laptop and noticed someone had now listed guns on there. Ross tried to rationalize that it was an American's constitutional right to have a gun, so this wasn't a problem. However, once again, his girlfriend Julia saw it differently. Ross, you have to stop this, she pleaded. Think about why someone would need to buy a gun anonymously. Ross and Julia argued about this, and Julia went off to her friend Erica's house to vent. Julia had become increasingly paranoid about everything Ross was doing, and so she confided in her friend Erica about Ross running Silk Road. She made Erica promise that she'd never say a word about it to anyone, and for a while, it seemed like she'd kept that promise. However, one morning Ross logged onto Facebook and saw a public post on his wall from Julia's best friend Erica saying, I'm sure the authorities would like to know about Ross Albrecht's drug websites. 
Immediately, panic filled his body, and he broke down in tears. A wave of emotions crashed over him. Firstly, he was angry Julie had told someone else that he was running the site. Secondly, he felt heartbroken that she would betray his trust like that. But mostly, the strongest emotion he felt was fear. He immediately deleted Erica's post off his Facebook wall and phoned her in tears, begging her never to mention it to anyone again. As for why Erica had made the post calling out Ross in the first place, it had all started when Erica had had a bad trip from a substance she'd bought off Silk Road. And when she got back from the hospital, she'd got into a fight with both Julia and Ross, which had ended with Ross telling Erica to leave. Erica, in an intoxicated state, had then posted on Facebook as revenge. Luckily for Ross, he'd seen the post quickly enough, meaning the post was deleted before hardly anyone saw it. And it was only their Facebook friends who would have been able to see it anyway, who probably assumed it was just a joke. So the crisis seemed to have been averted for now, but this incident made Ross extremely anxious. Julia and Ross's relationship also ended, as Julia refused to let Ross keep running the site from her apartment. She issued him with an ultimatum that he had to close the site down or leave. He chose to leave. In fact, after the Eric incident, Ross decided he needed to temporarily leave the country, just as a precaution, and so he went traveling. Ross went to Bondi Beach in Australia to relax. He went to Vietnam to celebrate the Lunar New Year. He even backpacked through Asia, hopping from different islands and staying in youth hostels. Of course, the travelers he met along the way had absolutely no clue Ross was running the biggest illegal site in the world and that he was now worth millions of dollars in Bitcoin. Life was good for Ross. The only downside of traveling was that Ross often had to rely on internet cafes to access Wi-Fi so he could run the sites. And he was understandably anxious about people seeing his screen and realizing what he was doing. Thus, he always had to pick a spot in the corner of the internet cafes. And he also programmed his laptop so that by pressing a certain key, he could immediately turn his screen black, just in case it felt like anyone was looking at what he was doing. The thought of getting caught was especially terrifying because he was technically a wanted man all around the world, since Silk Road was a global site. And the thought of ending up in a prison in Southeast Asia, where people had been known to get hanged for selling drugs, was particularly scary. The site's rapid growth also presented other problems. Turns out, Ross trying to build an entire marketplace by himself had meant the code was filled with bugs. One particularly bad coding mistake meant that briefly when someone purchased something on Silk Road, Ross lost money on the transaction instead of gaining money. Ross had no choice but to temporarily block new signups on Silk Road whilst he desperately tried to fix the issue. Ross was now working round the clock on the site trying to manage all these new issues that kept popping up, like attacks from hackers who demanded ransoms in Bitcoin, complaints from customers, and packages that had been seized in the mail. As word about the site continued to grow, Ross realized that just like any other growing business, he needed employees to help him. So he started recruiting internally by hiring active users of Silk Road to help him manage everything. Soon he had 10 employees, some rewriting his shoddy code, some moderating the Silk Road forums, and others dealing with support issues and disputes. Whilst Ross was technically paying these staff, most of them viewed it as more than a job, because they all had similar political views, and together they felt they were building something big here, and that Silk Road was going to change the world. Meanwhile, many other product categories also started popping up on the site. For example, some sellers started offering spy software and tools to hack into people's webcams. You could also buy passports and fake IDs, or even counterfeit cash that looked just like the real thing. And in one case, someone had even listed a rocket launcher for sale. And another was trying to sell cyanide, a well-known poison. Then one day Ross woke up to a message from one of his moderators saying, should we let people sell kidneys? Turns out one user on Silk Road wanted to sell various human body parts. The seller added that they'd all been acquired consensually. Ross was obviously a little concerned. This wasn't quite what he'd envisioned when he initially started the sites. But the way he saw it, Silk Road was merely a platform. Just like Facebook or eBay, it was the users who chose how to use it. It was against his philosophy to tell individuals what they could or couldn't buy and sell. He wanted a free market, so he didn't interfere. And as a result, the wide variety of illegal products for sale on Silk Road continued to grow, which continued to attract even more attention to the sites. What's interesting though, is Silk Road actually became a bit of a community. Many of you it not just as a marketplace, but a movement. On the community forum, Ross even introduced a Silk Road movie night, where once a week, many Silk Road users would all start watching the same movie at the same time. Ross's first film choice for this movie night was V for Vendetta, and the movie's anti-government theme was definitely popular with the Silk Road community. Silk Road also started running some competitions to help gain new users, where people could win various illegal substances. However, there was one incident where the competition winner ended up disappearing right after winning, and some presumed he'd overdosed on the prize. Ross joked that perhaps a better competition prize would have been rehab.
There was a particularly active user on Silk Road who went by the name Variety Jones, and he started helping Ross find bugs in the site's code and create a plan to help grow the site further. The two of them started chatting via private message every single day and became close friends. But in a bizarre way, he was kind of like a business coach to Ross. Whoever Variety Jones was, he clearly had a lot of experience with the drugs business. One day, Variety Jones messaged Ross saying, not to be a downer or anything, but what we're doing falls under the US drug kingpin laws, which provides a maximum penalty of death upon conviction. The mandatory minimum is life. Ross was very well aware of this, although he generally tried not to think about it. However, Variety Jones said he had a plan. The two of them were both fans of the movie The Princess Bride, and in that film there's a feared pirate called Dread Pirate Roberts. Except it's not just one person, the name has passed down from person to person over the years. Variety Jones said Ross should change his name on Silk Road to Dread Pirate Roberts, instead of just the username admin which Ross had previously been using. Ross loved the idea, because this way, if Ross ever got caught or connected to Silk Road in any way, all the blame couldn't be pinned on him. Ross could admit he'd once been the admin of the site, but he could say that just like in the movie, it was a title that was passed down from person to person, and he personally was no longer involved. He could claim someone else had taken over as Dread Pirate Roberts instead. From that moment forward, Ross went by Dread Pirate Roberts, or DPR for short. And him and Variety Jones continued to chat more and more. They'd even sign off each day to each other with messages like, Sweet dreams, Captain. Before connecting with Variety Jones, Ross had been feeling incredibly lonely, since obviously he couldn't tell anyone else what he was doing, especially not after what happened with the Erica and Julia instance. Ross had to lie to all his family and friends about his life. In fact, he told them he was a day trader, so they assumed he was just on his laptop so much because he was trading stocks. But now, having this digital friendship with Variety Jones helped him feel less alone. He now had a literal partner in crime. Of course, it wasn't all perfect. As the site continued to grow in popularity, there were multiple incidents where hackers managed to steal Bitcoin from Ross because of issues with the site. Or they would attack the site and Ross would have to pay them a ransom in Bitcoin to stop. Luckily, Ross was making so much money by this point that the hackers getting some Bitcoin from him didn't actually matter that much. It was just a normal day at the office. Ross had never believed the site would get this big. By the time the site was a year old, it was estimated to be getting at least half a million dollars worth of sales per week, which meant a lot of commission for Ross. Plus, around this time, the price of Bitcoin was rapidly increasing. So all the money Ross was making from the site's transaction fees was suddenly worth a lot more. By the end of Silk Road's second, year, it reached almost 1 million users, and Ross's personal net worth was reportedly tens of millions of dollars, most of which was Bitcoin stored on thumb drives scattered around his apartments. But Ross told Variety Jones that by the time he was 30, he wanted to be worth $1 billion. And incredibly, it looked like it could actually be possible, they just had to keep expanding. Within two years of launching, Silk Road was at nearly a million users. By its peak, if Silk Road was a normal company, it would be called a unicorn. The label given to businesses valued at over a billion dollars. It was unbelievable, really. A guy in his 20s running the world's largest illegal empire from his laptop. Ross had a slightly surreal moment whilst visiting the country of Dominica, where he realized Silk Road was worth more than the entire country's GDP. But occasionally, Ross would get a brutal reminder that the empire he was building did have some very real life consequences. Like when he saw this on the news. The synthetic LSD that killed the president was brought online so potent it made him think he could fly. He fell from a balcony and suffered horrific head injuries. Ross listened to the story of some kids who'd purchased a party pack from Silk Road containing a synthetic drug from China made it in an unregulated lab. The kids had heard about the site, simply gone online, followed the guide about how to buy Bitcoin, made an order on Silk Road, and the items turned up in the mail. Easy. But when one of the kids took it, he started panicking. He suddenly didn't know where he was or what he was doing. The room was spinning. He got up and started running. He had no idea where he was going and ran straight off the hotel balcony, falling 30 feet into the parking lot below. I would, I would just absolutely love to have seen what he turned out to be. No matter what your thoughts on Ross, you've seen what can happen if your browsing isn't protected. I think we can all agree we want to keep our personal information private and secure. And that's why I want to tell you about today's video sponsor, Guardio. Guardio is a browser extension that can keep you and your family safe online. It detects threats in real time before they cause harm and blocks phishing links, malicious websites, unwanted notifications, sketchy extensions, and many other types of threats. As opposed to traditional antiviruses, Guardio can actually scan sites and files before you access or download anything harmful. And since the browser is where we store payment details, 
files, crypto wallets, passwords, addresses, and more. It's crucial to keep your information secure and have real-time protection and alerts, making Guardio the perfect way to protect your vulnerable info. They already have over 1 million users worldwide and were recently even featured by Google. I've started using it and added my family members, which is no extra charge, and took control of my online safety. And I hope it will help you do the same. If you want to take control of your browsing security today, use my link guard.io slash magnatesmedia and get a limited time 50% off the first month. So that's only $5 a month to keep five family members safe. The US government was devoting more and more resources to the search for Dread Pirate Roberts. But considering multiple different government agencies were working on the case of Silk Road, like the FBI and the DEA, it might surprise you that the biggest breakthrough of all came from an IRS agent making a simple Google search. Gary Alford was a tax inspector who'd been assigned to the Silk Road case to try and track some of the money being laundered. However, he had pretty much no knowledge of Bitcoin, Tor, or anything else to do with Silk Road. What Gary did have in his favour was that he was very detail oriented and he read everything three times to make sure he never missed anything. Gary also liked to think outside the box. His favourite ever criminal case was how they caught the serial killer Son of Sam, who went on a killing spree in New York in the 70s. For a while, no matter how many detectives they put on the case, nobody could figure out who the killer was. But then one day, an officer decided to take a different approach and look for cars in the nearby area that had received parking tickets around the same time of the murders. The logic being that the murderer would hardly be concerned about running back to top up the parking meter whilst in the middle of killing someone. They found a pattern where the same car had received parking tickets on the night of the murders and always located fairly close to the scene of the crime. They then traced the owner of the car, and that led them straight to the murderer, who confessed. Gary liked this case because it proved you could outperform more experienced people by looking at the problem differently. And Gary was convinced the founder of Silk Road must have left a similarly small mistake behind, the digital equivalent of a parking ticket. Gary started his search by asking, what's the earliest post about Silk Road on the internet? Since he figured whoever started the site would have had to drum up interest in the first place. So Gary went to Google, typed the Silk Road web address into the search box, and using advanced search, he filtered by date, looking for results only from early 2011, which is when the Silk Road was rumoured to have started. Only a few search results came up, and one of them was a post from a user called Altoid on a forum called The Shroomery. The post sounded more like a user, not the creator of the site, but it was the first record online of someone mentioning Silk Road. So Gary searched for other posts by a user called Altoid from around the same date, and stumbled across a post on another forum called Bitcoin Talk, where someone with the same Altoid username had posted, has anyone seen Silk Road yet? It's kind of like an anonymous Amazon.com. Gary thought it was interesting that the first mentions of Silk Road online were both coming from this same username, and this person had been promoting Silk Road on multiple different forums right around the time that Silk Road launched. So Gary looked through Altoid's post history on the forum, and a few months after Silk Road started, Altoid had made another post saying, IT Pro needed for a Bitcoin startup. It was a job ad for a Bitcoin related project. But inside the post read, if interested, please send your answers to the following questions to Ross Albrecht at gmail.com. Now, when Gary told his colleagues about these findings, they dismissed that. They said just because this user was the first one to publicly post about Silk Road didn't mean he was the creator, which is true. They certainly needed more evidence to prove anything. But the more Gary looked into this Ross Ulbricht character, the more convinced he became that this was the guy behind Silk Road. First, by searching the name Ross Ulbricht, Gary found Ross's YouTube channel, containing videos about libertarianism, along with a saved video about how to get away with stealing. But also, Ross had used the username Oh Yeah Ross, Ross, which was interesting because whenever Dread Pirate Roberts messaged anyone or wrote on the Silk Road forum, he'd always write, yeah, not yes or yeah, always just yeah. It was a small detail, but perhaps more than just a coincidence. Secondly, Gary found Ross's LinkedIn profile, which had anti-government posts. Ross had written, the most widespread and systematic use of force is amongst institutions and governments. So this is my current point of effort. The best way to change a government is to change the minds of the governed. To that end, I'm creating an economic simulation to give people a first-hand experience of what it would be like to live in a world without the systematic use of force. Thirdly, they found a coding question related to Tor posted on Stack Overview flow, which had been posted by a user called Ross Albrecht. But within a minute of posting, he changed his username to Frosty instead. 
Clearly, he realized he'd slipped up by using his real name, and so that's why he changed it right away. Gary couldn't shake the feeling that this was the guy they were looking for. So Gary asked a colleague who worked for the Department of Homeland Security to do a search on Ross Ulbricht's name. And they found a recent incident on his file where he'd ordered fake IDs online that had been intercepted. When Ross had been questioned by an officer about this, he made a comment about how hypothetically anyone could go on a website called Silk Road and buy them. Why Ross said that is anyone's guess. Maybe he was trying to make the point that buying fake IDs wasn't that big of a deal these days, or maybe he just got overconfident that Silk Road could never be traced to him. But either way, Gary felt this whole thing was suspicious. Now, of course, all these different details still weren't conclusive evidence Ross Ulbricht was the creator and owner of Silk Road. But here's the thing, other important details about the case hadn't been shared with Gary. To be honest, nobody expected this IRS agent would crack the case that other agencies had been working on for over two years, so they hadn't bothered to fill him in on recent developments. You see, whilst Gary had been doing this research, the FBI had managed to find out the IP address of the server Silk Road was hosted on. Using that IP address, they'd managed to find out the server was hosted in a data center in Iceland, and by working with the Icelandic authorities, the FBI were able to infiltrate the Silk Road server. Now, as for exactly how the government found the server's IP address in the first place, that's a bit of a controversial issue. Some believe the NSA had some involvement and used an illegal spying tactic that would have infringed on Ross's Fourth Amendment rights. However, the government denied this and said the way they were able to get access to the server was because of vulnerabilities in Silk Road's code, which leaked the server's IP address. This is definitely possible because, as we've already established, Silk Road's code had plenty of problems because of how quickly it had been developed by Ross, who'd initially been working on it all by himself. Either way, now that the FBI had tracked down the Silk Road server in Iceland, they could access a lot of crucial data. Most importantly of all, they could see activity on the server, like whenever the Silk Road admin logged in or out. The logs showed the most recent admin login had come from an internet cafe in San Francisco. Whilst this was a major breakthrough, the FBI still didn't have any leads on who the hell Dread Pirate Roberts actually was. And that's when they got a call from Gary at the IRS. Gary got on a group call with agents from other departments working on the case, like the DEA and FBI, and he laid out everything he'd found. Gary explained that this person with the username Altoid had been the first one to mention Silk Road online, and he'd made multiple posts about Silk Road on different forums, almost like he was promoting the site when it first began. Gary said that the user had slipped up, and on one of his later posts included his personal email, rossalbricht at gmail.com. Gary then went on to explain how on Stack Overflow, a user had posted a coding question related to Tor under the name Ross Albrecht, but then a minute later changed the name to the pseudonym Frosty. At that exact moment, one of the other agents on the call cut Gary off and said, wait, did you just say Frosty? Gary was a little frustrated. He still had more to explain. Yes, I said Frosty, but why are you focusing on that part? Gary asks. The agent replied, when we got the server from Iceland, we found that both the server and the computer that belongs to DPR had both been given the same name, Frosty. There was a brief silence on the call. The dots were starting to connect. Gary then added that he tracked where Ross was currently living because of the incident with the fake IDs on his record. However, when Gary shared Ross's current address with the FBI, they couldn't believe it. Ross was living in San Francisco, just a couple of blocks from the internet cafe where they tracked the Silk Road admin IP address. This was clearly their guy. The truth was now clear to everyone on the call. The FBI agents, the DEA agents, and Gary from the IRS. Ross Albrecht was Dread Pirate Roberts. Gary had been right. The elusive criminal mastermind they'd been chasing for the last couple of years perhaps wasn't quite the criminal mastermind they'd thought. He'd made several major mistakes that exposed his true identity. His downfall was simply because of human error. This was a guy in his 20s who'd never expected Silk Road to become what it did, and thus hadn't taken enough care to cover his tracks. Or, as Gary would say, this was the digital equivalent of the parking ticket, a minor detail that had been overlooked. Either way, the authorities finally knew that Ross Albrecht was the one behind Silk Road. Now, they just had to catch him. But surprisingly, that wasn't going to be as easy as you'd think. The FBI assigned a team of undercover agents to track Ross and watch his every move. Because they had access to the Silk Road server logs now, they could literally see when the Silk Road admin logged in or out, and it always coincided with when Ross opened or closed his laptop. It was undeniable he was their guy, so why weren't they rushing in immediately to arrest him? Well, you see, they needed to catch him with his laptop open. That laptop contained all kinds of valuable data that would not only help in prosecuting Ross, but also in tracking down other people who'd worked on Silk Road or big dealers on the sites. But if a team 
team of agents just suddenly swarmed in to arrest Ross, he would likely have time to close his laptop lid, which would lock it. I mean, all the data was encrypted and near impossible to break into. Plus, if they didn't catch Ross literally sitting at his laptop, it would give him some kind of deniability. So they had to catch him red-handed with the laptop open in front of him so they could definitely prove he was responsible. When Ross woke up on October 1st, 2013, it seemed just like any other day. He initially went to a nearby cafe, but it was quite busy and he couldn't get a spot to work in that was private enough, so instead he went to sit in the San Francisco Public Library. He found a secluded spot where nobody could see his screen and logged into the Silk Road admin area. Of course, Ross was completely unaware that the library was filled with undercover FBI agents who were watching him. But remember, one wrong move from the authorities and Ross could panic and close the laptop, thus encrypting all the data. They couldn't let Ross know they were onto him or it would all be over. So, two undercover agents created a distraction right behind Ross, posing as a couple arguing. One of them swore loudly in the quiet library, causing Ross to turn around to see what was going on. At that exact moment Ross turned around, another agent who'd been positioned right next to him swooped in and grabbed the laptop off the table in front of Ross. Ross tried to reach out to grab it, but it was too late. Another agent had come up behind him and handcuffed him, placing him under arrest. It was all perfectly timed, so Ross had no chance to react. Ross had been caught logged into the admin section of Silk Road, and in the corner of the computer was the name Frosty. And not just that, on his unlocked computer was a full diary about running Silk Road, along with thousands of chat messages he sent whilst running the site, all of which could be used as evidence to convict him and verify this story. Newspapers and TV stations all around the world covered the story. The Boy Scout who'd been secretly running a website that trafficked an estimated $1.2 billion of drugs, weapons, poisons, and other illegal goods. His family was sure he'd been framed or there'd been a mistake. This couldn't possibly be their Ross, could it? Sometimes when I'm researching these business stories, they feel more like the plot of a Hollywood movie than real life. But they do say that the truth is often stranger than fiction. And this next part is absolutely ridiculous. So after the authorities got hold of Ross's open laptop, they could see everything, including all his chat histories. But this led the FBI to realize there was a government agent who'd been working on the Silk Road case, who had been privately messaging Ross and accepting secret payments from him in exchange for information about the case. This corrupt agent was Carl Force, and he obviously thought because the messages were encrypted and the payment was in Bitcoin, he would never get caught. But now the government had Ross's chat histories and records of the Bitcoin transactions. It had all started when Carl initially posed as a big time drug smuggler on the Silk Road forums under the username Knob. He began messaging Ross, or as he knew him back then, Dread Pirate Roberts, and started to build a relationship with him. Once Carl had built up some trust with Ross, he told him that he knew of a mole within the DEA and started selling information about the Silk Road case to Ross. Of course, Carl himself was the mole. He was taking payments from Ross in exchange for information about the case. Over the course of several months, Carl received over $750,000 in Bitcoin in exchange for sending information to Ross about the Silk Road case. But things get much crazier. You see, one of the employees Ross had hired to help him with Silk Road was a guy called Curtis Green, who had become a site moderator. But one day when Curtis got a large shipment of coke sent to his house, he was caught by the Baltimore Task Force and got arrested. Ross was obviously confused why his moderator suddenly stopped replying to him, because at first he had no idea Curtis had been arrested. And then he noticed Curtis had stolen $350,000 from Silk Road, because as a moderator, Curtis had access to some of the site's funds that were being held in escrow. Now, Ross obviously assumed Curtis had betrayed him, that he'd stolen money from the site and then vanished. But in yet another twist, it wasn't Curtis who stole the money from the site. It was another corrupt agent on the Baltimore task force called Sean Bridges. After arresting Curtis Green, Sean had logged into Curtis's Silk Road account that had moderator privileges and started transferring some of the Silk Road Bitcoins to his own personal account. So this government agent was basically siphoning money off Silk Road to his own personal Bitcoin wallet whilst logged in with Curtis's moderator account. And just to be clear, Sean wasn't doing this to turn the money over to the government. He was moving the funds to his own personal private accounts, thinking he wouldn't get caught because it was in Bitcoin. So just to recap, we now have two different corrupt agents working on the Silk Road case who were both part of the Baltimore Task Force, both with their own separate schemes to steal Bitcoin for themselves. As for Ross, he obviously had no idea about any of this. He just assumed Curtis had robbed him. So. According to the chat logs from Ross's computer, he decided to hire someone to go after Curtis. Initially, Ross didn't want to kill him. He just wanted his money back and maybe to beat him up a bit. However, Ross's inner circle that
that he spoke to on Silk Road, like Variety Jones, persuaded Ross it was the right decision to have Curtis killed, because he needed to send a message that he couldn't be crossed. Otherwise, other Silk Road employees might think about betraying Ross in the future as well. Ross had to send a message. Ultimately, Ross agreed, and asked if anyone could kill Curtis. One of the people who saw that request was Carl Force, the other corrupt agent who was part of the same team who just arrested Curtis. Sensing an opportunity to make yet more money for himself, Carl replied using his knob username and said he knew some pros who could get the job done. He said they need 40k up front and 40k after the execution was complete. So Ross sent the first half of the payment. Carl then got Curtis, who he had under arrest, and staged his death. They took a photo of what looked like Curtis's dead body, except Curtis wasn't dead. It was just a staged photo. But Ross didn't know that. He assumed the hit had been carried out successfully and paid the rest of the money to Carl. Ross did write back that he was a little disturbed by the photo, and explained, I'm new to this kind of thing. It was clear he was quite distressed about issuing a hit on someone. But as far as Ross knew, Curtis had stolen hundreds of thousands of dollars from him. So he rationalized that having him killed was necessary. In reality, of course, Curtis was alive, and it was the corrupt agent Sean who'd stolen the money from Curtis's moderator account and the other corrupt agent Carl, who'd faked Curtis's death in order to make even more money from a supposed hit job. Shortly after this, Ross would end up ordering hits on five other people who crossed him, including a hacker who was trying to extort money from him. As far as Ross was concerned, he now had the power to pay to get anyone killed if he needed to. In the diary on Ross's computer, he wrote, sent payment to Angels for hit on Tony76 and his three associates, which was then followed by an update about some work he'd done on the site that day. It seemed like ordering a hit on someone had now just become a fairly normal part of the job to Ross. But again, and just like with the hit he ordered on Curtis, none of these murders Ross paid for ever took place. No bodies were ever found. It seems Ross was simply getting scammed by other people claiming to be hitmen and nobody had actually been killed. Which was lucky for Ross, because when he eventually got caught in the library and all these messages he'd sent were discovered, the murder for hire charges against him were dropped. Because even though they had evidence from his chat logs that he paid for those hits and that he believed the orders had been carried out, it was all an elaborate scam. And he couldn't be convicted of murder when nobody had been murdered. Now, for legal reasons, I should stress that Ross's family still maintains that someone planted those messages on his computer and that Ross never wrote them himself. As for Carl and Sean, the two corrupt agents, both were sentenced to around six years in prison each. It's seriously crazy that two separate government agents working on the same case both tried to steal so much money and secretly transfer it to their own Bitcoin wallets. And if Ross hadn't been caught, they likely wouldn't have been caught either. But of course, Ross was caught. And now it's time we look at the final and most crucial part of all of this. What what actually happened to Ross? Okay, it's time for a very quick break while I ask you a favor. If you're enjoying this video so far, please turn on the notification bell for Magnates Media. I'm posting mini movies about business, money, marketing, and more, but just subscribing doesn't always mean you'll see them. So please consider turning on notifications, and I'll love you forever. Ross was being charged with seven different offenses, including drug trafficking, money laundering, and the kingpin statutes, something which was normally reserved for cartel leaders. However, even though Ross had been caught with his fingers on the laptop whilst logged in as the admin on Silk Road, he still pled not guilty. His lawyers admitted that Ross had started the Silk Road, but claimed he had done so as a social experiment, not as a business to make money. They then said shortly after he started the site, things had begun to get a little out of control, and thus Ross had decided to sell the site to someone else, who went by the name Dread Pirate. Roberts. They claimed that after that, Ross had no further involvement in the site, and that Ross was simply being set up as the full guy by the real DPR. They argued the chat logs and diary on Ross's computer had been planted there to try and pin all the blame on him. However, unfortunately for Ross, the evidence against him was overwhelming. He had literally been caught logged into the Silk Road admin page, loaded on his laptop, whilst at the library. Not just that, the chat logs on his computer dated back multiple years, and showed everything he'd said, including the conversation with Variety Jones, where they invented the Dread Pirate Robert's name as an alibi if he was ever caught. Messages also showed DPR telling someone he was buying fake IDs because he needed to expand Silk Road server space, and these messages were sent right at the same time that Ross's fake IDs were intercepted. As for the notion that Ross sold the sites, there was absolutely no record or indication of that. Plus, Ross had still been receiving all the Bitcoin from site commissions, so it seemed clear he was still the one who'd been running it all this time. From start to finish, Ross had been Dread Pirate Roberts. Despite this, advocates came from all over to support Ross during the trial, with many of them protesting on the steps of the courthouse that he was a hero. They said that all Ross had done was run a website, and if that was a crime, then the CEOs of eBay and Craigslist should stand trial too, as illegal goods were sold on those websites as well. The jury did not see it the same way. They returned 
their verdict, guilty on all counts. The chat logs and files on Ross's computer were just too damning. If he'd only closed the laptop lid when in the library, it's likely they wouldn't have been able to prove so much. Before his sentencing, Ross sent a letter to the judge, which said, I've had my youth, and I know you must take away my middle years, but please leave me with my old age. Please leave a small light at the end of the tunnel, an excuse to stay healthy, an excuse to dream of better days ahead, and a chance to redeem myself in the free world before I meet my maker. The judge did not listen to this. Ross received two life sentences plus 40 years with no parole. In other words, Ross would spend the entire rest of his life in prison. Some felt this was overly harsh, but it seemed the judge wanted to make an example of him to try and deter other people from setting up similar marketplaces in future. The judge also explained her decision by saying that she disagreed with Ross's philosophy that drug use only affects those who take the drugs. She said there are many other people who are hurt because of the dangerous substances sold on Silk Road. People die and lose loved ones, families get ripped apart, junkies are created, and in many instances, addicts lose their ability to care for their children, and a generation can grow up neglected and orphaned. In other words, Silk Road caused irreparable harm to many people. The judge also pointed out that whilst no bodies had been found, Ross had commissioned five murders which he paid for, and he fully believed they'd taken place. Ultimately, the evidence against Ross seemed conclusive, and thus, Ross was sentenced to life in jail. Of course, there's two sides to this. On the one hand, there have been studies that showed people were much less likely to be physically harmed buying these substances online compared to on the streets. And Ross tried to argue Silk Road actually made the experience much safer, especially with the review system on the sites. If these people were going to buy illegal goods anyway, Silk Road was probably a much safer way to do it. Ross was also technically a first-time offender, and this was a non-violent charge, and so the life sentencing did seem unusually extreme. Because yes, Ross built the Silk Road platform, but aside from the initial shrooms he grew, he wasn't selling any drugs himself. He was a web admin, and you could argue that drug trades happen all the time on platforms like Facebook and Snapchat, but that doesn't mean the platform creator is to blame. On the other hand, there is clearly a big difference between Silk Road and those other sites. Those other sites don't allow illegal sales, whereas Silk Road actively encouraged it and made it possible. Plus, in 2015, a study from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention said that for the first time in recent history, more people had died from opioid-related overdoses in America than from gun deaths. They found one of the main reasons for the rise in deaths was due to the ease in which people could now gain access to these substances. The growth in substance abuse coincided with the growth in popularity of Silk Roads. In other words, people got access to items they likely wouldn't have been able to access without Silk Road, and in multiple cases, that led to people dying. Silk Road made it easy for people of all ages to access unsafe substances and illegal goods, and Ross enabled that. In fact, he personally approved the sale of countless extremely dangerous items. However, no matter what side of the debate you fall on, you have to recognize it's not fully black and white. What does seem clear is that Ross was the creator and operator of Silk Road, and that from February 6th, 2011 to July 23rd, 2013, it's estimated well over 1.2 million unique transactions happened on the site, and 9,519,664 Bitcoin was generated in sales. Of that, 614,305 Bitcoin was taken by Silk Road as commission. Some of that money was reinvested back into site growth, staff, and maintenance, and some of it Ross took for himself. Back in 2013, when Ross was caught, that money was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. As of today, it would be worth tens of billions of dollars. It's ironic, really, that Ross was a big fan of the show Breaking Bad, as there's clearly parallels with his own story. A seemingly total normal guy who descends into becoming a drug kingpin, gradually getting more extreme along the way, like ordering a hit to get someone killed. And likewise, both started out with a more noble objective. For Walt, it was to pay his medical bills. For Ross, it was to give people freedom. But both seemed to end up liking the power and wealth they gained a little too much. And they got carried away and pushed things too far. Until finally, it all caught up with them. Even though the judge had expected that the sentencing she gave to Ross would deter anyone else from creating another Silk Road, in reality, almost immediately after the original Silk Road site got shut down, Silk Road 2.0 popped up. Arguably, all the attention of the Silk Road case just got more people interested in the idea. However, sequels are rarely better than the original, and indeed the multiple Silk Road sequels haven't quite gained the same notoriety as Ross's original sites. Silk Road 2 lasted exactly one year, before federal agents found the server hosting Silk Road 2 in a foreign country, and realized the 
and if it was registered to the email address blake at bentall.net. Turns out, a guy called Blake Bentall, who was allegedly operating the site, had used his own personal email account with his full name in to set up the server for Silk Road 2. So just like Ross's use of his personal email address led the FBI to him, the same happened with Blake. I'm still not sure why you would possibly use your real personal email address for that. Anyway, once again there was some controversy around how the authorities were able to locate this server in the first place. Some think governments used a potentially illegal spying technique, and others think the Tor network itself may be compromised. There's all kinds of theories, but none of that has stopped countless other similar dark marketplaces popping up over the last few years. Generally, as one shuts down, another one tends to open. Although quite often it turns out the entire site was a scam in the first place, or even a honeypot by the government to catch dealers. Interestingly though, many of the people who set up these Silk Road clones or similar illegal marketplaces do so under the name Dread Pirate Roberts. So in a way, Ross's vision of a free market that would live on and be passed down from person to person did kind of happen. Although since Ross is facing the rest of his life in prison, I doubt that's much consolation. Now if you found this story of Silk Road interesting, I think you're really going to enjoy this video I made about Mark Zuckerberg's enemy, the Bitcoin billionaires. This video looks at the rise of Bitcoin, including its ties to Silk Road. 